Welcome everyone. I'm joined today by Jack Krasuski, a member of the Halkion Guild. Jack's been with us for one and a half, almost two years, and has been translating Heidegger. What we're going to be discussing today are some of the suggestions that uh, Jack has come up with on how to think um, Heidegger, Heidegger's terminology in English. Maybe briefly, just as an introduction, when we translate in everyday vernacular sense, then the dictionary can take us very far. We can mostly get by and find the train station and order a beer or fish and chips or a pizza. Uh, but once even in vernacular language, you start translating one-to-one -one, uh, idioms, right? Um, for example, the German, Ich bin heiß auf ein Stück Kuchen, so I'm craving a piece of cake. If you translate that into English, it would be, I'm hot on a piece of cake. That's um, quite meaningless. In English, you can say barking up the wrong tree. To say in German, den falschen Baum hochbellen means very little. So as soon as we get to idiomatic um, expressions, we already are at a dead end if we just use a one-to-one -one transfer. So and what, what Jack... Um, has been doing throughout the courses is always providing us with ways of, let's say, a saying again of, of some of the fundamental words in Heidegger that um, have then uh, spread throughout so that we've started uh, using some of them because they do make more sense once you start seeing that from the other side of the language. So check, it's very good you're here. Um, feel free to introduce yourself a bit more if you want, and also just to begin with any word or concept that you'd like to begin with. Thank you. Yeah, yes, thanks, Johannes. I'm really looking forward to our to our dialogue uh, today. And, you know, you brought up the, the concept of translation. And I think before we get even into any words, I think we can explore the concept of translation because in, it in itself needs to be interrogated Right, so, you know, translation is from translatus, you know, latus just means to carry and trans means across, so carrying across. And so right away, when you say translation, what is it that's being translated? Well, you know, I think at the top of like, uh, if you looked in the dictionary, it would be translating, carrying words from one language into another language or translating. But even in vernacular language, we will often say, well, we're translating, you know, a bench science, foundational science into commercialization, into a commercial product. We're translating our research findings into a product or service that we could sell and make money uh, from. So that's translation or you know, translational research, even, you know, R&D research and development. Development is already a translation. So, you know, even in vernacular, there's more than one meaning. And then when it comes to uh, philosophy and in particular uh, Heidegger's philosophy, you know, it, it, it further, you know, the, the, the word translation really opens up, you know, I, I think many more meanings and possibilities. And so one of the things I wanted to, um, to read, and this is from Ivo Di Gennaro's book, The Weirdness of Being, right? And one of the essays he has here is a conversation, a dialogue between himself and Parvis Ahmad, right? Who's a Heideggerian scholar and translator from the German uh, into the English. And as you mentioned, he's... Um, Iranian, and so his uh, native language is Persian, and yet, and yet he learned English and German well enough in order to translate. And I think his translations are often very, uh, very, um, I think, powerful, very generative, and, and, and on the mark. But uh, Ivo de Gennaro and Parvis Ahmad have very uh, different uh, approaches or philosophies, one might even say, of translation. So, let me read a paragraph. This is Ivo uh, Di Gennaro talking about uh, Parvis Samad. This is not yet Parvis speaking. 
And so um, Ivo de Gennaro summarizes, he says, the, the presupposition upon which Ahmad's part of the conversation rests may be summed up as follows. The interlingual, right, between language translation of Heidegger's keywords and phrases should take its orientation from the intralingual translation uh, that de facto occurs when Heidegger endows familiar and ordinary German words with new meanings and uses these newly framed but familiar and ordinary words as keywords and phrases of his thinking. Taking its orientation from Heidegger's own intralingual translations, the interlingual translation of the keywords and phrases achieves the status of an approximation. This is very important, an approximation. Accordingly, with his choice of words, that means Parva Samad's choice of words, such as anoning, almost, and upground, to name but a few, Imad approximates Heidegger's terms at Agnes, Wesen, and Abgrund. Now, those are actually pretty good translations. They make sense to me. I feel them. They impact me. Uh, I believe I achieve a certain understanding. Mm -hmm. But what Ivo uh, is basically then goes on in this dialogue to point out is that his project is not one of approximation. It's one of saying again or saying anew. So I think this brings up uh, an important um, distinction that I'd like to make right away <clears throat> in, in terms of, of, of language and, and just how we speak. And that is the difference between designation and indication. So, you know, this, this, uh, this finger, right, the, one, the finger right next to my thumb, this is my index finger, right? And it's the index finger because it points. It's the pointing finger, right? I go to a bakery and I say, which donut do you want? I say this one and I point to it. I indicate. So indication means pointing to. What is it pointing to? It's pointing to the thing in itself. Designation is very different. Designation, I'm no longer pointing to the thing in itself. I have now abstracted from the thing in itself and I have designated it. I have named it, I have defined it, I have conceptualized it. And so often in, in language and especially in translation, there are two levels of, uh, at which you can translate. So what Ivo is saying is he wants to point at the thing itself. Clearly, he has to understand the thing in itself. What the heck is Dasein? What the heck is Ereignis, right? So it, you have to understand by going to the thing in itself. So this is not even translating a word, a word from one language to another. It's translating or it's understanding the thing in itself deeply enough that you could then name it anew because you are thinking it anew. So when you are you know, tr approximating words, you're on the level of abstraction. You're on the level of designation. Like what word is most similar to this other word in another language? But when you're indicating, you're going back to the thing in itself and you're saying, do I truly understand the thing in itself? Maybe I don't. So some, um, uh, when I read, you know, not only Heidegger, but uh, writers on Heidegger, sometimes you get very wildly different um, conceptualizations and understandings of Heidegger. And some of it has nothing to do with the wrong word choice in English, whatever wrong, you know, but, you know, or different word choice in English. It goes back to a completely different understanding 
of the thing in itself that Heidegger is talking about. And for some people, and I will point out why uh, Ivo De Gennaro, he's one of my <laughs> favorites, he is extremely difficult. He makes Heidegger simple and easy to understand. But the thing that I keep going back, Ivo De Gennaro's writing is my ailment. It, it, it causes me um, suffering uh, because it's so difficult to understand. And yet I cannot let it go because I believe that he is pointing me to the thing in itself and, and all its richness. There are other Heideggerian philosophers in English, maybe, I don't, you know, I don't know if it's true of German speaking, native German speaking philosophers of Heidegger, but some English speaking philosophers of Heidegger seem like they have a very compressed view somehow a, um, a uh, uh, understanding of Heidegger, which is really contracted, which is <laughs> a term, Ivo's, one of Ivo de Gennaro's terms. So it's somehow contracted, it, it's, its richness is lost. It moves in the realm of designations. It does not capture the full thing in itself. Now I mentioned, the word uh, understanding, and it's one of my favorite words, so I wanted to explain a little bit what it means. There are um, not many words in English, but at least three, and one of them is understanding. Maybe, yeah, briefly, two things, and then we go straight to understanding. You said okay. that Janaro's uh, writing is, uh, is an ailment. Let's hope, yes. it, let's hope it is in the Greek. I meant that as a compliment. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> But let's let's hope it's in a Greek sense to pharmakon, uh, so it's both uh, poison and also the cure. It's it's the right pill. It just depends on the uh, on the uh, dosage. Uh, and something else that Jack uh, pointed to, which I just wanted to stress a bit further, which is very crucial, is this very very uh, well um, articulated distinction between indication and designation or let's say going to the phenomenon itself, the thing itself, or to abstraction. And once we are an abstraction, then we find also is, is in this translation or in this way of saying what is at stake, because something real is at stake, is not just trying to get the argument right, is something shining forth or not? And this is what Czech pointed us to. And there's also in, in Heidegger, uh, not to quote authority, but it's, it's, um, it, it's crucial to understand why this why this is so fundamental here and basically with any thinker. What Heidegger says about to hypokemenon, which is, has come to be translated as subjectum or substrate in Latin, what he says, so this comes from the Greek, from Aristotle mostly, and it's translated into Latin. And then from through the Latinization of Europe, uh, through the Roman Empire, up until this day sustains itself in the word subject, subjectivity, uh, substrate, etc. What Heidegger says about this, though, you'll find this in the origin of the artwork, is that it's effectively a simulacrum, this word. Why? Because there's no experience um, that went into this translation. It just looked at, in the way that Czech just described, what is it that approximates the word most closely. And Heidegger makes a radical claim when he points this out, and he says, this is where the, the abyss or the bottomlessness of the Occident opens up. So I'll leave it at that. We go back to the understanding. It's just the way in which uh, Czech pointed this out. I think it's very uh, crucial to understand the difference between going to the phenomena or just staying, staying on the level of abstraction. Yeah, thank you for those uh, kind of expansions on, on the themes. Uh, yeah, so understanding, so in, in English, the word uh, under obviously usually means beneath, like something is beneath, is underneath something else. But in the word understand, it means in the midst of. So you are, when you understand something, you are in the midst of standing within it, you know, and, and, and what is it that you're standing in the midst of? Well, it could be 
you know, the material objects, you know, uh, things in nature. You could be standing in a field or a forest and you can understand it, meaning you really understand it. And understanding has uh, components of both knowledge, you know things, you could put them into propositional uh, language, but you also have a skill. So if you understand a forest, you're able to navigate it. And I think the same is true on the conceptual realm, in the conceptual realm. If you really understand things, then you are standing in the midst of the concepts and you understand their properties and their boundaries and all of their relationships, right? And this is what, you know, we have as the, you know, kind of the frames of meaning, the frame of meaning, uh, you know, kind of an epistemology, it's like the coherence where uh, ideas cohere with each other, you know, correspond, that means they correspond to something real in the world, but something could be coherent without being corresponding to anything, right? So I think understanding has that aspect of, again, being among the, the things themselves and having both the knowledge and the skill to navigate through them. And by the way, um, this will come up later, but the same um, meaning of under as in the midst of also occurs in undergoing and undertaking. When you're undertaking something, you're not underneath something, you are in the midst of taking, of doing something. When you're undergoing, you're in the midst of uh, going through something. And I'll talk more about this because to me, it's a uh, it's crucial uh, component of understanding muglichkeit, um, which I translate as occasion, which I, I wanna move to. But another, let me just, you know, cause we could talk about translation the whole time and, and, and I don't think we want to, but there's something else now. This is, uh, you know, the contributions to philosophy, that's at Agnes, right, uh, of the event. And I wanted to, there's a very, I think, crucial thing that not even in Heidegger's text, but in the translator's introduction that I think is, is crucial, again, to kind of understand um, what tr the, the, the different uh, aspects of translation. So let me read uh, this. This is like uh, about half a paragraph. So he says, as regards its essence, the book is the exact opposite of a private pondering. Right from the start, Heidegger denies that uh, these are to be understood as his own personal contributions to philosophy. This, and this next part is crucial. Instead, we have here a speaking of the event of Aragonus. And then he says, speaking of, and the of is to be understood primarily in the sense of the subjective genitive. These ponderings attempt to let themselves be appropriated by the event. Thus, what is here struggling to come to words arises out of a view of thinking that is radically different from the traditional metaphysical understanding of thought as the generation of concepts out of the thinker's own spontaneity. That radical difference accounts for the struggle. So to me, that kind of struck me like a thunderbolt when I read it because it just, what it, what it uh, shows is that Heidegger is making a leap, a leap into the unknown, that he is a, a child as we all are of metaphysical, understandings and of language as it, um, it occurs in the here and now, right? And yet he's leaping into, the, into, a, into a future unknown and he's trying to speak from a new beginning. And how can you speak of something new when the new has not yet occurred? You, it's a leap, it's an act of faith. It's by acting in the unknown that you bring about that unknown. You, you, make, you, you make it occur. You leap into, into the not yet to bring it into, the, into, the, into presence. And that I think is um, a dramatic understanding. And I think 
that that is a lesson for anyone who considers him or herself a thinker is, you know, there, there's one, one way to be a thinker is just to understand things as they have been handed down to us, what is already present, and then to become an expert on Heidegger or whatever it is. It's another thing to think the not yet, to think the unknown, to make it happen. This is what artists do all the time, right? They, they, they are seeking, searching, experimenting, letting themselves go in some way in order to bring upon, about a vision that's not yet. And they, may, and they bring it into, into presencing, right? And it's beautiful. And so a thinker in that sense needs to, uh, or can learn from that, uh, from the stance of an artist leaping into that not yet into the unknown to make it to make it be to allow it to become to come into being and this is why it's um, often difficult to understand because we are you know like like that term the future is not evenly distributed so now when we're reading heidegger or understanding some you know a very new uh, form of art we are standing in our, you know, current, current here and now, in our current understandings, um, in our current conceptualizations and, and the frames of meaning. And we're confronting something that challenges us that is um, beyond our ken, beyond our understanding. We're not standing in the midst of it yet. We are challenged, we are confused. We are struck. We are struck with wonder or fear or awe or unease or anxiety. <laughs> and, but that's what makes it, this is really when you feel most alive. This is when you feel most you're participating in being itself, that you are, part of the unfolding whole. So I'll, I'll now say one, one last thing about, uh, about this concept. Um, and that is, you, you, you know, you've known me long enough now that, to know that one of my uh, favorite phrases of Heidegger is the Geläut, Geläute der Stille, you know, the ringing silence or the ringing stillness. And this is where we can bring this, um, his, um, again, participation, Heidegger's participation in something beyond the current concepts, the current abstractions, and, and bring it down on the ontic level of a praxis, of a, of a personal praxis. So, you know, Heidegger, we can learn his thought but we can also learn from his praxis. He was after all, a very skilled phenomenologist. In fact, the year after he published uh, Being in Time, he published, uh, he was an editor on a book of Husserl's phenomenology. And he was also a very, um, uh, a very uh, deep thinker on uh, Christian theology. He was going to become a priest. So there are these aspects of, of Heidegger that we should keep in mind. So in addition to his thought, we could learn from his, his methodology, his phenomenological hermeneutic praxis. You know? And so I think the reason I really uh, resonate strongly with the Geläute der Stille is because I saw how I could make use of that. So uh, not to go into too much detail, but I basically, you know, I, I tend to have biphasic sleep. That means I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm up for about an hour. And I started writing. And I, first I started not writing. I just started uh, allowing myself to rest, to pause, to dwell in the moment. 
And, and then what I realized is how, you know, I'm awake one moment uh, or I'm asleep, then I wake up and some thought strikes me. I don't choose to have a thought. I don't choose which thought to have, right? As the Buddhists say, thoughts have us. We don't have thoughts. You can say experiences have us. We don't have experiences. And so if you can just dwell and, and listen and attune yourself to that stillness, to the silence, you never know what's going to happen. So what I discovered in my own ontic existence is that the first thoughts that would come to mind were these, what I would call these surface, like the flotsam and jetsam, like on an on a ocean surface, you know, like the foaming foam on top of a surface. And just these mundane thoughts like, oh, what time is it? Uh, what time am I, do I need to wake up? Am I gonna be tired today because I'm up in the middle of the night? And then after those thoughts kind of burnt themselves off, the foam, whatever, changing metaphors, the foam just dissipated, then there would be silence and stillness. And then thoughts would arise, right? And then I think the important thing to realize in all of this, and I'm going to bring this up also when I talk about occasion and mukhlikite, is that we are partially agents we as humans choose. We are not just the vehicle for being itself uh, as some sort of marionettes, puppets, you know, um, taken over by fate uh, without any agency. We are, we do have a destiny. We do have, we are, you know, uh, uh, undergoing experiences that are brought about completely not by ourselves. We, we also undertake, we are agents at the same time. And so when I started writing in the middle of the night, I found that I was both undergoing experiences, undergoing thoughts, but I would also undertake them. I would try to elaborate them. I would come up with my own like I felt that I had agency over further thoughts that I would in a way present back to the ringing stillness. And the stillness would tell me if I'm on the right track or not. Through an ontic experience, I either felt when I felt when I when I was on the right track, the Goloita der Stille would uh, would translate into a feeling of both like an excited calmness. I would be both like energized and also feel like, yes, I can rest. I, like I'm both excited, but I don't, I'm not striving. I've come to rest because it's the right word. The word, the actual word in, a, in English language resonates with the primordial word that comes from the from the ringing stillness, or that if I bring as an offering to the, to the ringing stillness, it tells me back whether I'm on the right track through a phenomenal experience that I actually would experience. So this, and this is the, you know, I wanted to stress that because we, I think anyone listening to us is probably, you know, also interested in themselves coming up with a praxis of thinking, of interrogating, um, you know, their primordial concerns, their ultimate concerns, uh, interrogating being itself, if you will, to whatever your, your version and word for that may be. Thank you. In some sense, one could perhaps also say that it's through the allowing the ringing of silence, responding to it, that uh, appropriate translations can be found i would say uh, it requires in you know very succinctly put now but it requires a, a certain calmness and also slowness i would say not trying to find the correct word which is easy to find but the word that speaks out of that which is at stake um heidegger himself says about the ereignis that it's an untranslatable word that's mentioned in the 
Satz der Identität, that's the prin principle of identity usually in English. It's a bit striking that the translator of that text in English, uh, Joan Stambaugh, did not include this entire passage on the Ereignis, on what he has to say about translation that miss, that's missing in the English. So uh, that's only there in the German. This might be because maybe it wasn't included in the beginning in Heidegger, but anyways, it's missing. Heidegger says, like Logos and the Tao, the Chinese Tao, the ancient Greek Logos, Ereignis will not be translatable. Um, Another way maybe of saying so the contributions have the title Beiträge zur Philosophie vom Ereignis, Contributions to Philosophy of the Event is usually the title. One could also perhaps say it's uh, out of the event or from within the Ereignis, let's say. Because the Ereignis is described by Heidegger as a realm or as the realm where human being and being meet. And that's important. This, Jack mentioned this also. It's not in Heidegger. We're not passive. We're responding and addressed by, but it's the way in which we respond that we're free in that response. Uh, in the so being addresses in a multifaceted way um, uh, the human being all the time, uh, and its epochs aren't clear cut. Right uh, in a in this check mentioned you mentioned before the uneven distribution of the future uh maybe a bit more uh, this nick land a bit more poetic we could say but the 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 waves of being um are not, uh, not perfectly uh, controllable and we all stand on different islands but we're free in our responding to it um so while there is ascending that is not um, a, a predetermined fate and the way in which we respond echoes back into being and comes back out again that response so um so you see it all occurs through language and it says and i maybe i've put it it occasions itself in a certain way so here we are the word for for möglichkeit i'll say a bit on möglichkeit in the german afterwards i think when you've yeah, well, thank you for that. But it, it, let me move to Muglikite, but let me actually go back to what you just said. And, and it just shows you, um, I think, the what insights can come from just dwelling on certain words and, 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 and thoughts and really doing it slowly. So again, look at the translation of the title in English. It's Contributions to Philosophy of the event. Now, yeah. if I read that, and, I, and I, I know, I've known that title for a long time, and I never understood it until I read that part of the paragraph from the translator, which you just captured in what you said, it's contributions to philosophy from out of the event or from within the event. That's completely different than contributions of philosophy of the event. I mean, what does it mean of the event? It's, it's, it's obscure to me. I, I don't understand what that means. I mean, I understand the words, but I don't get the like, oh my God, he's speaking. He's thinking from out of the event, from this not yet, bringing the, 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 the again, the not yet, the possible, the occasion, like the likelihood into 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 actual into actuality, right? So that we, you know, he's like he's like a uh, a scout, but not moving in, you know, geographically through space, but moving through time into the future to bring the future into the present for us, right? So you just even what you just said, just those that one change from change of the event to from from the event, which is better, but when you even, even go beyond it to say from out of the event, it gives you completely uh, different experience, even phenomenally, it ex you experience it. It's like, it's like a fountain, like uh, it's a contribution to philosophy from out of, like uh, the source is like a fountain. It's coming, you know, that like, wow, the future is the event. Agnes is that source. 
And in fact, somewhere in many places, probably, Heidegger says that there's nothing a priori to the event. The event is the foundation. It is the source of all. So now, you know, we're going to run out of time. So if, no, no, if you don't not. mind, let me move on to the two occasions now. So, we're not running out of but, time. We're, we're running into time. We're running into, we're, we're, running, letting, we're, we're let, running in time. We are time, right? Yes, we, we are, are time. time. We let, yes, as you said on the weekend, we let time <laughs> yes. gather itself. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Take all the me, time. Uh, what I wanted to talk about is Muglichkeit and then, um, and, and then connect it also with Abgrund. And then I could uh, connect it to Ereignis, but Ereignis is so big that maybe we should save it for another discussion so we can kind of really give it its yeah. due. Yeah, that would but be let me start off with uh, Muglichkeit. So Muglichkeit is uh, translated almost always as possibility, possibility. The only person I know who uh, translated, translates it differently is, again, Ivo de Genaro, who translates it as likelihood. And he has very good reasons uh, for it. And I don't really want to get into it because it's like, um, uh, first of all, Ivo should be, you know, kind of des describing himself. It's a very rich, again, multivocal, multivocal, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, thinking anew of the word Muglichkeit. But um, I fell upon the term occasion and I wanted to talk first about uh, why we may not want to use possibility as a translation of Muglichkeit. There's a lot to say here, but let me just give the most kind of thing that's most forward in my mind about it. Possibility is a very contracted, kind of meager um, sense of what uh, Heidegger meant by Muglichkeit. So, you know, when, I, when we think about possibility, you know, so human is, you know, presented um, in their life with, with choices. You know, I can choose, um, you know, to have a chocolate eclair or, uh, you know, a tiramisu. You know, I have these kind of options ahead of me, uh, in front of me, and I can choose this or that. I can have a sandwich for lunch or soup for lunch, but that's really missing the most, own the most core of what Muglichkeit means. So let me first talk about occasion and then I give a visual metaphor for it. So occasion, it's a common uh, English term that actually has a lot of different meanings that are kind of subtle. So I can say, for example, um, you know, Johannes invited all of us to his house for a special occasion. And we're gathering there on the occasion of his birthday. Or I can even say, uh, we're gathering there occasioned by his birthday. And while there, I will have occasion to meet his family, okay? So occasion has the word cause in it, right? So it's something that can cause something to happen. But the common you know, definitions are that it's, a, it's like an event, a happening, and usually something that's special. And it, it's usually kind of unrepeatable. It's like there's a certain right time for it. It's, it's an occasion that's not gonna repeat. Now we can, you can invite us to your birthday next year, but you're gonna be a year older. It's not the same occasion, right? And then this is the most important part. So occasion is opportunity and it has, it's an opportune time, which in Latin is tempus. So you would often go to an oracle to find out when was the opportune time to wage war wage peace, do whatever you were doing in, 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 in Rome. Yeah, do and as the Romans do. Just, what's that? Do, do as the Romans do, I just said that. Yes, do it, yes, Never. right. So what, what it captures is, um, so again, on, on the aspect of a, an event or a happening. So 
actually in English, they're the key core word of happiness, happy, happiness, happening, uh, happenings, whatever, is hap, H-A-P. Hap means fate, fortune, luck. Not good or bad, just that we are um, undergoing fate, gashik, right? So gashik is also kind of bring, brought in into occasion. And so, you know, um, we often say someone is lucky or happy or fortunate, but we really should be saying if we want it to be complete, he is, he has, the, he's the beneficiary of good fortune or good luck or good happiness. Because happiness just means I'm in the state of being, of undergoing fate, of fortune, of destiny. So the important thing about occasion that I'm trying to bring out is that we are both, both agents and what the opposite of an agent is is a patient so when i'm an agent i under undertake like undertake a project now if i go to the hospital because i need an operation i don't undertake an operation i undergo an operation i'm a patient so in in occasion it really brought, draws out the agency that we have and also the of patience that we are. We undertake and we undergo. And to me, this really has uh, its core to uh, throne projection. You know, the, our facticity where we're now in our current place and time and we're projecting out into the future. And as we project to the future, we are both undertaking a choice, uh, make, under, you know, taking a decision, making a decision, and we are undergoing fate. You know, there's unpredictability to us. Um, it's out of our control. So we're, it's, as we are projecting, we are projecting, there's opportunity there. We are agents and we are patients, we undertake and we undergo. Now, here is where, you know, I wanted to bring up like a crucial, and in my mind, a very beautiful part of this. And I'll start with a visual metaphor. So I was actually watching a, a video like three weeks ago or something about uh, like bridges or viaducts that they build in uh, earthquake prone parts of the world. And these structures are, you know, they're, they're not like connected um, immobily to the ground. They have these joints that articulate. And then each section can be separate. So each section, when there's an earthquake, could be moving independently in order not to destroy the structure. So that articulation and the independence move. So let's say I'm walking on one of these bridges or viaducts and I'm taking a step from one section to another and there's an earthquake. Well, I both choose the direction of my step, right? My placement, I choose my placement, but also because the things are moving, I also do not choose where my foot will land. So I both undertake a step and I undergo a step. I undertake a decision, but I also where I land is beyond what I choose. And it's that gap. Now this is a spatial metaphor, a gap, right? Where things articulate. Now imagine this and change the spatial metaphor to a, a temporal one. So as I am projecting, leaping from my, into my next moment, I'm projecting, there's a gap. There's a gap between each moment. And that gap is crucial because that's where freedom lives. Freedom, choice, discernment, decision. And we call that decision, the key word there, um, the core word is decision. 
like incision is a cut in, excision, I cut out like a tumor, decision is a cutting off. So that means when I decide I am rejecting certain opportunities or possibilities because I'm committing to other ones. And also because of that gap that where freedom lives, that means we do not live in a clockwork universe. It's not that at the very beginning of time, you know, that there was, um, uh, you know, like, again, this is that kind of the Newtonian kind of physics where like little billiard balls and like, you know, every, all the little billiard balls were just bouncing off each other. And all you had to do is measure carefully enough and have enough calculative power with supercomputers to, you know, to, to calculate all the bouncings off and stuff like that. And that you can project from the very first moment exactly the, how the universe would evolve from the beginning of time to the end of time. And it's just a clock. It's a mechanism, it's a machine with no freedom, maybe even no randomness. And yet it is not the kind of universe, it's not the world that we live in. Our world has randomness. It has so many interactions and dynamic ones where causes uh, have effects and effects become the, the, cause, uh, the cause again, they circle back, right? That these dynamic feedback loops um, and, the, and there's unpredictability and there's something that occurs that can never be calculated, you know, uh, that could never be operationalized. And that's where freedom lives. And so now I'm talking about kind of Muglichkeit in terms of a human being, maybe, or even in, maybe in, in the sense of a human way of being like Dasein. I think the same thing holds true for uh, Aragnes. Aragnes is the gathering together in which occasion takes hold, in which freedom occurs, where freedom uh, arises. So Aragnes is not guaranteed. Aragnes is, uh, does not necessitate, it allows. It opens. And so that's what Muklichkeit is. It's not whether I choose an eclair or a tiramisu. It's just that within my way of human being as Dasein and my participation in being itself as Aragnes, there is freedom, right? It's like I participate in the unfolding whole without the outcome being known. And not to get into Aragnes, but just to kind of say, and this is very interesting, Heidegger uses the German term Aragnes, which is a common term for event. And then he says in multiple places, but Aragnes is not an event, it's not a happening. And then he, but he tells us what it is. He says it's a law, but he says it's the gentlest of laws. So basically it's not, Aragnes isn't the event like me talking to you and you talking to me. It's the source of eventing. It's the source. It's the foundation uh, of, of uh, you know, the opening. It's the opening of the clearing for Aragnes to occur, for freedom to occur, for participation in the whole, where um, the whole being itself needs us as a site of its own being. And we need to participate in being itself, right? To be an owned by being itself, to come into our own, to be who we, you know, are meant to be in a way. So it brings in, you know, a sheep. It brings in agency. It brings in freedom and choice, discernment, decision. Um, and I think to me, that's what Muklichkeit is. And then I'll just say one last thing, and I, and I, I would love to hear your thoughts on it, because you wrote an entire book about death. And of course, death is, you know, uh, the, the possibility of impossibility. 
But what I wanted to say is whenever I confront Heidegger and, and in English and it says possibility, I could very well replace that word with occasion. Every time I read Ivo de Gennaro, where he uses the word likelihood, I can replace it with occasion. It just makes sense to me. It makes phenomenal sense to me. And to me, that's the measure against which, you know, I have to judge whether something, um, for me, you know, not for anyone else, but for me, whether it's a generative translation or generative understanding even prior to that. Yeah, thank you. Briefly, maybe if you could say a bit more on why possibilities, I agree, but why is it very contracted and meager in your English ear? Um, if you'd like to say more. Well, because it, it, first of all, it seems external to me. Yeah. Like I'm moving yeah. through the world. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm moving through the world and it's just like there's a lot of different objects in the world. And I am just a desiring creature and, and I'm reaching out, you know, I'm reaching out, right? Um, I have this very kind of a meager care structure uh, understanding of the world. And I just reach out to the things that are more desired than other things. And it's just like, I'm in this kind of like, I don't know, like this candy shop or bakery where there's all of these options that, you know, should I watch this channel? I have 500 other channels to, to watch. But what's really missing, it's not the options that the world is presenting to me from all of its richness. It's me. How do I comport myself? How do I decide? How do I know what's important to me? So possibility does not address what is own most to me. It does not address how I can be an owned by being itself to become, uh, uh, in, to, co to come into my own. It's just talking about like objects, objects of desire in the world to me. Yeah. But it doesn't really refer to what is most important to me, what I have to cut off and what I have to commit to. And how do I make those decisions? Like, how do you decide? Is it just like, you know, like from Geleute der de Stille, you know, it's like, hmm, I have a taste for an eclair. Mm, yeah, chocolate tastes better than, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, there's more to it, you know? So it makes us just simply like some sort of, um, you know, um, it, it's, we, we move so far away from Dasein as a way of being almost to ourselves as yeah. coming into our own. Uh, it cuts us off from being itself. We are just these kind of like automatons driven by desire and kind of momentary choices. <laughs> you know, like wh why, why do you go out tonight and have a beer with friends as opposed to reading or spending time with your child? I mean, how, how does all of this how does it all decide? And then what does it mean about you, right? What, what, who are you becoming? Who are you becoming? Possibility does not answer that. There is possibility in occasion and muklikait and likelihood. Yeah. There is possibility. I'm just saying that's far from the core concern yeah. of muklikait. Yes, yeah. Um, so, Briefly, possibility comes from posse, so it's related to being able but capable, and also to power, etymologically. Yes. Um, and Heidegger could, so he doesn't speak of potence uh, or potentiality. So when Heidegger speaks of possibility and actuality or mög möglichkeit und wirklichkeit in German, um, there is a hint of, say, uh, um, the, the metaphor physical Thomist or Aristotelian schema of dynamis and energia, but it's not exhausted by it, especially when we get to the question of, or the phenomenon of death. Uh, very often uh, possibility really makes almost um, uh, no sense insofar as if you say death is the own most, it's already a stretch in German to say the tod is the eigenste Möglichkeit des Daseins. To say death is the own most possibility that it gives 
as nothing to actualize or gives Dasein nothing to actualize is probably at the very edge of what can be said in, in, in English or probably it makes almost no, um, no sense. In fact, when, however, let's say this here. So let, let's look at the etymology of occasion. I'm going to read this is from the online etymology dictionary. So occasion, opportunity, grounds for action or feeling, state of affairs that makes something else possible, a happening or occurrence leading to some result related to cause, reason, excuse, pretext, opportunity, all the things that Jack just pointed out for us. And then opportunity also, so from Latin occasionem, the appropriate time. So now we're dealing with something else. Now we can translate death as the almost possibility or the almost möglichkeit, perhaps as saying, it's the almost appropriate time. It's in this moment that our, that Dasein's being comes most radically before it as its time, insofar as that time is finite, temporalizing itself, coming to an end. Um, and in that intensity of the finitude that comes to the fore, the so-called, let's say, most own authenticity of Dasein comes out as well. So we can already hear something else completely. And I think when, especially when you read the early Heidegger, we find uh, his language, and he says this himself in the letter on humanism, the language is still steeped in academic speak of the time. So he speaks in a certain academic language, uh, and he does that because he has to, uh, or he doesn't realize it yet that he has to speak differently. Very briefly afterwards, that all goes out the window. So in the lecture courses, only a few years after being in time, one on Plato's cave, there's there's almost so nothing um, that, that could that even sounds a bit like um, being in time. And in the letter on humanism that I just mentioned, he will say, so this is where the, the Gennaro's translation comes from, this attempt to say that Möglichkeit is likeliness, because Mögen does indeed come, or Möglichkeit does indeed come from uh, Mögen, which means to like. But again, also in German, it's not, Mögen is not exhausted only by liking or even loving. So it can also mean to be capable of um, Mögen, also is related to Vermögen. Vermögen is also related to being open to. I briefly, only briefly mentioned my own uh, book. Um, there's a passage in the, one of the later writings, I think it's Building Dwelling Thinking, where Heidegger says that the mortals are those who are capable of death as death. That's the usual translation, which in, in, which in German is, die Sterblichen sind diejenigen, die den Tod als Tod vermögen. Well, that sounds very vacuous, it's at best an existential truism, what are you saying? Mortals are those who die. So, but vermögen means to be open to death as the gathering of concealment. We won't talk about that one now, but we will, I think, when we go to our Agnes, because that's when we have to consider withdrawal, concealment, etc. Um, so I think um, that, so I, that's why I say it's to be open to death as death, which is an, maybe a bit clearer than what Heidegger means here. Um, I think maybe that likeliness is too much of an approximation as a, as a translation rather than a saying again, because it stays too close to, the, to the, the German vernacular, but then doesn't fully maybe come over into English and, and open something up, because that, that's, that would be the art, right? Uh, to open something up in, in English. And what I noticed last year is that some people uh, started saying occasion I don't know if you noticed, I did actually, a couple of dialogues with, with Guy Sengstock, for example, and others in Axel. Um, because I think occasion, if you think about just the etymology and how it's translated, for example, again, it's appropriate time. So it's in death that Dasein runs into its, its being that is appropriate to it, which, which is granted by its time, which is the time that Dasein ecstatically is. And also in the gap between that that check that you mentioned that there is a in occasion also a hint that of of uh, a certain element of that that's not um, controllable 
etc. So in in death, well, how does Heidegger I come back to death again? If Heidegger says death is the almost say possibility usual translation that is uh, certain, um, unsurpassable, and um, that's the only three I can remember now. So let's say the let's 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 say occasion. So death is the almost unsurpassable certain occasion. Occasion in what sense though? Occasion is that which grants or opens up one's appropriate time for one. And that is then, so you can say that death is the non-available, that which cannot be controlled, that which is also a gap in a certain sense, an open wound in Dasein, opens Dasein up to that which it is not yet, but could be and could be authentically, insofar as it then tears itself away from the inauthentic ways of the everyday and the melange of the everyday. So, and that occasions itself again. So, it's not under. It's not. It doesn't happen at will, and I can't will it. It. It's. This is why when you know, check you connected this to Ereignis. We cannot. The Ereignis can come and it can not come. It. It. It occasions or it, and then we need to respond. But if it doesn't, then we can respond all we want and nothing can come about. So it, that, that's a very important connection because then we can also see perhaps a bit better how the Heidegger of being in time relates to the later Heidegger and how it really is there in notions such as Möglichkeit, say, occasion and death and the question of being in that way. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's how about how you put it? The gathering together of occasion that allows and opens up and grants, but doesn't necessitate. And that's an eignis. And at the same time, uh, that cannot be willed into action. So the eignis is- Yeah, that, that's uh, beautifully said. I mean, um, it very much resonates. Uh, there's uh, everything you said, um, I would uh, strongly <laughs> agree with or resonate with. and. I do agree uh, that uh, you know our finitude is 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 a gift. It's it allows us to come into our own. If yeah. we did not have finitude, again, I would you know what what would be there 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 is no point. It's just again being faced with possibility with no way of 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 deciding um, of of cutting something off and committing to something else because. Without finitude, it, nothing would matter. The whole care structure would fall apart other than just immediate gratification of stuffing my face or whatever it, it, it is. So finitude is, uh, is necessary for us to, again, uh, come into our own. And, and, but of course, you know, it's being towards death. It's, it's being, always being open uh, in a way living, uh, living within uh, the, uh, knowledge, um, understanding, participating in one's in, in one's finitude. You know, death is not somewhere far off. You're participating. You're living in, within, from out of your finitude in each and every moment. Right. Let me just add another um, word I wanted to, uh, which I think is mistranslated, and I wanted to get to because I think it is related, and that is abgrund. Abgrund. So um, it's translated most commonly in English as abyss, which is it's just, just wrong. So abgrund is a German word. And then we're taking a, 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 a Greek word, abyss, from, mm -hmm. from the Greek, and, which has different connotations. Mm -hmm. And then we're trained and then using it in English. Well, we should go back to Heidegger's German word and not through Greek, Greek, you know, and, and into English. So ab grund, so grund is like ground, like, you know, and it's a common German word, like, you know, I, I wanna buy your house in the grounds, you know, not just the house, but the ground on which it stands and the grounds, you know, around it, right? The plot of land. And then, uh, and then there's a prefix, ab, ab. And that's why um, Ahmad actually uh, translates, translates as ab, ab ground in English, but usually it's translated as abyss. But anyway, ab means away from, 
moving away from. So it, it's a, uh, for example, in um, a, anatomy, when I move a part of my body away from the midline, like right here at my shoulder, I'm abducting my arm. And then when I move it towards the center, I'm adducting, adducting, abducting. Of course, abduction also means when you kidnap someone, you're stealing them away. You're stealing them away. So ab means away. So now keep that in mind. So it's really like away ground. We would translate more literally or moving away ground. But now let me talk about uh, abyss and why it's wrong and then get back to the uh, ab ground. So away ground. So abyss is really uh, from uh, bisos, uh, which is bottom, and it's the privative, alpha privative, a uh, bisos, lack of bottom or bottomless, bottomless. The abyss is bottomless. You can't reach, maybe there's a bottom, maybe there isn't a bottom. We don't know because it's so deep, we can never, we don't even know. And abyss is also, in English, and I think it's uh, in, in, uh, translated in the King James Bible in Genesis, abyss is the term for the kind of um, uh, uh, primordial chaos. So abyss often okay. in English has that kind of like that primordial chaos, you know, the abyss, like something bad, something very negative. Yeah. But I think abgrund is completely different. It's, it's ground, it's the away ground. Now, um, Evo translates it as off ground. And he has his reasons, and I'm not going to uh, say one thing, one way or another about it. But to me, the best way, it's like away ground or awaying, awaying ground. So, right, so being itself does what? It, it moves, it withdraws, it gives. Now, what does this mean? It sounds like a negative. It conceals, it withdraws itself, right? But what it really means is that the awaying ground, it gives way. So you can also say abgrund is the giving way ground. Now listen to that term, giving way. So when I'm walking, let's say, on a path along a river, and there's like a, you know, it's a little bit of a ravine there. I'm on the edge of like a little ravine. And it's the river is high, or the, the rains are been raining, and the ground is very wet. And it could fall, it could collapse. We say, oh, it gave ground. The ground gave way, and I fell into the river. Right? Big problem in California, those um, a lot of those hills, mountains in California are made from what's called amalgam. It's basically stones and mud. When the rain there's enough rain, they basically, the whole mountain turns to fluid, to a liquid, and it just falls like, like just like, like a milkshake and just buries whole towns. So ground gives way, right? Uh, the other thing is if I'm like jogging, um, I don't wanna be jogging on concrete because it does not, it does not have give, it does not give way. I want to be jogging on something that gives, like a track or maybe even through the grass in a forest, forest path. Why? Because the ground gives. So just think about that. Abgrund is the giving way ground. It gives way. And why does it give way? And what does it give way to? It gives way to Dasein so that we, can have our human way of living, of, of um, having uh, or being or participating in mukli kite. That's what aragnas is. It's the giving ground, right? There is, as gibt, it gives. The ground gives so that we have space, what, you know, whatever space means, um, space, time, play, right? The occasion, the opportunity to come into our own. So it's, it's a holding ground that does not designate us. 
does not designate us. It gives us the freedom to come into our own, to be our own, to be Dasein, to be particip to participate in aragness. So it's not it's not the abyss. Ah, it's I don't I don't really understand off ground completely either. It's the it's the awaiting ground, or mm -hmm. I would probably translate it as the giving way ground. Mm -hmm. It's holding, yeah, but it's not designating. Yeah, it does not form you. It does not operationalize you. Uh, it yes. does not turn you into standing reserve. And and that's very good because that uh, that deeply relates to the way which you said it. The, you know, Abgrund is the giving way ground, holding us, not designating us. You said it much better. Why? Yes. Because it relates. It relates to the other inception, the other Anfang, the other an other beginning, as is usually translated in Heidegger. In the sense that, so the tradition is not not uh, destroyed or, or completely uh, uh, abandoned, but there is a Zuspiel. So a playing forth, which is a word from, from, I think in America, you would call it soccer. In Europe, we call it football. Um, so a, a pass that's, you know, the ball is, is shot and it's a playing forth to the other side of the field uh, so that the other team member can uh, continue in the way that then the, how the situation changes, right? Which is cannot be projected once the ball is, 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 is played forth. Uh, you don't really know how the other players uh, respond to that new situation. So it all is, it, it comes about um, freely in that next moment and then it continues. So in that it gives, say, there is a ground on which we stand, which gives way. It's not the abyss. We're not in chaos, not in primordial chaos, as it could sound. Uh, Heidegger, by the way, relates this explicitly to the Ereignis and, and to, to the time space. Uh, Zeitraum uh, as well in, in the contributions. So it gives us way to become us in this um, time in which the metaphysical no longer speaks to us uh, as it, in a, in a, in a genuine direct uh, sense. So that is the, um, in a sense, you could say that's what the, uh, what we can hear, because so I mean this is always just this strange you know, why does it matter to anyone what philosophy does I think it, it does for for reasons that are profounder that maybe we can understand in so far as philosophy has to hold open an access to the world and as Aristotle as the Greeks would say to save the phenomena and if philosophy is at a dead end or a standstill where all it does is uh, provide epigonal renaissances and new isms, um, a new realism, a new skepticism, a new idealism, whatever is next after the new realism thought is over, um, then it doesn't address that which is, but is in, and to speak with Czech said, is just designating and abstracting and playing with these abstractions rather than going to the phenomena themselves. Um, and that I, I can hear that in this way of understanding ab, Abgrund now as a giving way ground, providing ground, but not, but in a free way, um, that this re really relates to Ereignis profoundly, which, as I just said before, is spitting. I mean, the Ereignis is, so. Yes, yes. You should address yes, it. Exact, you're exactly right um, that Abgrund, um, it's, it's also part of Muglichkeit. It's that gap I talked about, yes. that gap of freedom. That's the giving ground that things can move, that we are not designated. We do not live in a clockwork universe, that there's freedom and choice and decision to be made, that things move as we are projecting into uh, the future, into our authentic selves, one would hope, uh, as we are participating in Aragnes. So I think Muglichkeit and uh, Abgrund uh, and Aragnes are really pointing to the same thing. There might be different aspects we can yeah. talk about, but it's really, it's really, uh, it's that, it's the gathering, gathering where we are annoyed 
by being yeah. itself in order to come into our own and being itself gives way to allow us to come into our own to become Dasein. And the way we can most become Dasein is by interrogating being itself. I mean, to kind of put it in a, in a kind of universe, universe, universal ontic sense, it's sort of like, you know, the universe uh, continues to unfold through le levels of, of ontology, of, 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 uh, of uh, levels of nature, you know, from the physical to, to where you have space and time and the laws of nature to the material universe, to the animate universe, you know, to sentient creatures and then to sapiens. And so when we are engaged in thinking, interrogating being itself, it really is being itself through us interrogating itself, elaborating itself. I mean, in a way we are as the site of being itself, we are like the buds on the, on the very buds on the end of the branches of a tree, the tree being, being itself, being universe as it elaborates itself, as it becomes conscious of itself, uh, as it thinks itself. Again, do we have thoughts or do thoughts have us? Well, both, you know, yeah, yeah. we are a coalescence, uh, you know, material coalescence of being itself. Yeah. And, and within us, in our, in our phenomenal field, our ability to be conscious and to think uh, through language, you know, being continues to elaborate itself. We are like the tip of the spear of being or the bud on the end of the branches of being itself on the tree of being itself, to put it into a, a, as like an antic uh, metaphor. That's very good. Yeah, it's, and, and we could perhaps also say, this is something that came up a couple of days ago also, but um, the, what is in play also always is memory and recollection. Now we won't go into it now, but we will when we discuss the Ereignis. Um, and I think the, the image of the tree is significant. You have to wonder why, the, why philosophers always come back to the tree. Uh, Descartes, Bishop Barclay, um, Heidegger certainly, um, Plato, so uh, we might be tree like this. One more thing in that I'd like to mention on the Agnes that the check you pointed out briefly, and I'll say just something on it as an introduction for next time, which is that there is you said there's no a priori of the Agnes. There is a poem by Heidegger. I don't know when he wrote it, um, and there's a footnote to the poem by him. So uh, where he says, and there's also there's mention of this in the so okay in terms of Heidegger scholarship, not not that it matters much, but there is a there's a there has been a trend since Gadamer, who was one of Heidegger's students, who's also quite well known, to turn Heidegger into a, a second coming of Schelling. So um, that means when he, Schelling speaks of the Abgrund, uh, that that must be the same Abgrund as in Heidegger and and. And when Schelling speaks of the unvordenkliche, either the immemorial or the unprethinkable, that's what Heidegger must mean by Ereignis. That's a bit of an impasse on the side of scholarship. So, you know, when, it, when looking for influences goes rampant, and very often it collapses into finding identity, where what we should rather do is to go the path of thinking, which is this. What is it that Schelling is responding to that also Heidegger is responding to? It is the Ereignis, which to the metaphysician Schelling is unthinkable, is not yet thinkable. <laughs> That's exactly how uh, Czech started this, right? Is not yet thinkable. That's what he means. So it's not to say, oh, they're both, you know, they have this a priori concept, blah, 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 blah. No, for Schelling is not yet thinkable. In the poem, and actually it was in passages in the contributions that we'll go over next time, Heidegger says it was unprethinkable, not yet thinkable, also not memorable. Immemorial is one of the other translations. It wasn't yet memorized. Um, insofar as metaphysics is does not think being itself and cannot think the withdrawal because metaphysics from its inception can only 
attest to withdrawal as negative absence, but not as a say in a very you know succinct way of putting this as a positive phenomenon of its own. So uh, for Heidegger, the Ereignis really is the is the not yet thinkable, but now to be thought. <laughs> so the scholars get it right to that that far, but then no. So um, maybe that gives a bit of a like let's say a, a ground, an up that was that's I have to chew on this now. Because of yeah, no, that was that was very yeah. well said. Yeah, I mean, I th I think this is uh, I think this is great. I, I, I you know, let's let's kind of uh, sleep on this and <laughs> think about it, and then I, I would really look forward to you know the next our next conversation where we can talk about. Yeah. You know more about at Ad, Agnes and uh, you know the clearing and and other uh, you know truth the truth of yeah. being that's think, also yeah. very interesting and I think yeah. that could be translated differently so I think there's a lot obviously a lifetime several <laughs> lifetimes to cover but anyway I found this very generative so thank you so much uh, Johannes for the opportunity of course I take thank you thank you yeah excellent all right thank all you. right all right well I'll see you soon then.